coming at you. Fantastic. All right, hi everybody. Uh, so for just some introductions. Uh, my name is Nathan Voss. Uh, I'm a senior engineer at a startup in Columbus, Ohio called, called Finite State. Uh, right now we're just getting started, but we're developing um, defensive IoT security products. And I'm Parker Wixel. I'm with uh, Battelle Memorial Institute. We're a uh, security and a scientific research organization. Uh, I've been in the industry 25 years and uh, a security uh, analysis reverse engineer. All right, so before we really get into AFL Unicorn, I wanted to at least set some groundwork and go over what exactly AFL is and what Unicorn is. Um, hopefully, a lot of people in the room already know. Um, but AFL, um, as, a as a vulnerability researcher, somebody who uses fuzzing a lot, um, AFL has completely revolutionized how, I've done, how I do fuzzing. Um, whereas before, I used to just send a lot of random stuff in and build a lot of custom protocol-specific uh, data models. Um, now I can really us usually just use AFL to do input generation uh, and code coverage analysis for me. Um, so basically, it's, it's a really easy to use tool. We'll go over it a little bit more in, in a minute. Um, Unicorn Engine is a very, very lightweight scriptable emulator. Um, it's based on QMU, um, but it's basically stripped down to be as minimal and thin as possible to the point that all it really does um, is it takes the binary code that you give it and it just executes the instructions one by one with no real um, hardware support or peripheral or memory management built into it. Um, other than that, you can map memory in and out as, as you please. Um, so what we've really done is we've taken AFL and Unicorn and combined them into AFL Unicorn. Um, so uh, for an example of AFL, um, AFL out of the box works really, really well on command line applications. So as an example, um, if you echo something into a file like hello.txt and then you run cat on that, that will obviously print it out. Everybody's familiar with cat. Um, if I wanted to fuzz cat uh, using AFL, it's really, really easy. You just install AFL, and you say AFL fuzz. You give it a path um, to where the inputs are and where you want the results to go. And then you give it the command line that you actually want to execute and fuzz, which would be cat. And then you use the special at at symbol to replace the, the parameter that's going to be fuzzed. It's going to contain the mutated data. Um, once you execute this, AFL starts up and it starts fuzzing the, the process. It does code coverage analysis, mutates the inputs as, as, it, can, as it needs to um, to get farther and farther in the program. Works great. Um, so we use AFL whenever we can, uh, but what if, what if you were asked to do vulnerability research on something a little, little different than a command line application? Something like, say, say a CB radio um, or some other RF peripheral. Uh, I mean, you'd sit down at your desk, you'd say, all right, AFL fuzz, you have your path to inputs and outputs, but then what? Um, so, uh, in, my, in my career, we've been asked to do this a whole lot um, on very, very odd targets. Um, they do all sorts of different things and take input from very unusual sources. Um, so over the years, uh, me and my colleagues, we developed uh, an informal method of doing things um, that works pretty well, but it has some limitations. And that method uh, looks something like this. Uh, you take that target and you do a bunch of RE on it. Uh, you tear it apart, you look at the code, you figure out um, what sort of protocols it talks, and then you determine which protocol you want to fuzz, and then you spend a bunch of time creating a protocol-specific data model, um, which we then uh, used to feed into uh, the Peach fuzzing framework. Um, we love Peach and everything, but it's a little bit cumbersome to use. Um, and then, so once we've spent time developing that, the next step would be to create these custom crash monitoring scripts to determine if the device is crashed or not, and then another script to, determine, to figure out just how to input everything in. And then, once we do all that, we're actually ready to start fuzzing. Um, this process works pretty well, but it has some, some problems. Um, the time to set this up, uh, we would estimate it to be between one week and two months, depending on the complexity of the target. And then even once you get it up and running, uh, your throughput's extremely slow. Um, on, in a very optimistic case, you might get a half to 20 executions per second, um, sometimes even slower than that, depending on, on the exact specifics of your target. Um, so after playing with this setup and using it for, fairly successfully for a number of years, um, suddenly, AFL became our, our kind of go-to way to fuzz normal, typical command line applications. And then also emulation has gotten much, much better. QMU has gotten a lot more solid. And then Unicorn came along. So we started thinking, rethinking how we do this. And what we came up with is, AF, is AFL Unicorn. Um, AFL Unicorn looks something like this. Uh, you take that same target, and then uh, you just need some ability of debugging that target. And I'm, I use the term debug in the loosest terms possible. Basically, you need to be able to set a breakpoint, run to that breakpoint, and hit it. And then at that breakpoint, you need to be able to dump memory and dump CPU state. Um, so if you can do that, then you, you 
you use your script or whatever it is um, to dump that save state. Uh, and it has to contain the complete memory snapshot of, of what you want to fuzz and then the CPU state at that starting location. Once you have that, uh, you take your save state, you write a unicorn script, which is going to start from that um, save state, um, you know, the, the saved instruction pointer and memory um, map, and then it's going to run to the point that you that you've determined the interesting stuff has stopped happening. Basically, like let's say a parsing function for some protoc protocol. You then take that script and then you run it under AFL Unicorn, which we'll give a little more details on how exactly you do that in a moment. Um, and then AFL Unicorn iterates and generates new mutated inputs and feeds it back into the script and it keeps on doing its thing. And AFL works none the wiser as to the fact that you're actually emulating. Uh, with, this, with this methodology, uh, we've seen massive gains in, in throughput and performance. Uh, and it's a lot easier to get set up too. Uh, it takes, we would, we would estimate between one hour to two weeks to get this whole thing up and running. And then once you actually have it up and running, your throughput is, is way higher than the previous method. Um, we've typically seen between five and a thousand execu ex executions per second, and that's per core. So if you have money to throw at the problem, you can just buy more hardware and scale this out. So if you're getting a thousand executions on one core, you buy a 32 core system, now you're getting 32,000 executions per second. It's massively uh, faster. So to summarize AFL Unicorn, uh, before really getting into it, uh, it basically lets you use AFL to fuzz absolutely anything that you can run under Unicorn Engine. Uh, again, there's, there's no source code required. You're just going to be loading binary into, into, into Unicorn and letting it go. Um, and it eliminates a lot of limitations that AFL is known for having, namely that inputs have to come from the command line. Um, so people think that AFL doesn't really handle network support, although there, there are other ways of doing that. Um, but this really just eliminates all of those. And then it minimizes your time to vulnerability discovery. Uh, as a vulnerability researcher, I'm not paid to create some sort of harness that feeds inputs into my target device. I'm paid to find vulnerabilities. So anything that I can do to minimize the time to finding that vulnerability is, is a benefit to me and my customers. Um, and finally, it only fuzzes the code that you care about. Um, whereas most fuzzers need to like start the whole process up, run the test, and then shut the process down and start that over and over again, uh, with, with this methodology, uh, it only fuzzes the exact code that you care about. You're going to say start at this address and run to this address and that's it. Um, so that can increase your throughput and limit, um, you know, limit the time you, you waste running code that you don't really care about. Um, all right, so instead of going into the internals of AFL Unicorn and, and boring you with all the technical details, I thought it'd be better to give you an example of how we've used it um, and, and give you the workflow that, that you can then apply to your own problems. Um, so for this example, we're going to use uh, one of the binaries from the CGC, the Cyber Grand Challenge from last year. Um, it's called the FSK Messaging Service. And this, this messaging service is built um, to replicate an RF uh, piece of hardware. Uh, so the, the service itself takes uh, raw analog sample data on standard in, so by the command line, and then it feeds that through this fairly complex demodulation logic. Uh, and then at the end of that, you end up with packets that are actually human readable. They have you know, type length value fields that represent like a chat program. So each packet at, at the middle stage contains basically like um, you know, this package that has this many bytes uh, is intended for this user. And then that ends up getting parsed by some message packet parsing logic. Um, the reason we chose this uh, was very specific. Th this particular challenge, uh, the authors claimed that it would um, be extremely difficult to fuzz. And also beyond the, the state-of-the-art input reasoning and capabilities of, of solvers. Um, so this was a, a, an interesting challenge to try to, f to find vulnerabilities in by fuzzing. Um, so the, the overall workflow we, we've used AFL Unicorn with is, is very much the same from target to target. And I think I've generalized this down to, to these steps that you see. And, uh, and hopefully you can apply them to your, to your targets pretty easily. Uh, the first stage is to figure out exactly where you want to start and end your fuzzing. Um, and what that means is really you want to think about the code and, and do some RE and figure out where does the interesting stuff happen and where can, you, where can you bypass the stuff that you don't really care about. So thinking back to this picture, um, just thinking about it as, as a hacker and uh, trying to figure out where the exploits might be, I'm going to guess that the interesting bits in the code aren't really in the demodulation logic. They're probably in the message packet parsing logic where they're decoding type length value fields and doing things that are very frequently result in buffer overflows or, or um, you know, problems in logic. Uh, so really, we only want to fuzz that last block. And with AFL Unicorn, we can do exactly that. We just need to figure out where that code is and then how it 
that code gets its input. Um, so in this case, it was pretty easy. Um, since the CGC binary is open source, we just opened up the source code and looked where do the bytes actually start getting parsed. And luckily enough, for us, it, it was pretty obvious. It's a CGC receive packet function. Uh, and it has three parameters that are pretty obvious what they are. There's a pointer to the raw packet data. There's the number of bytes in that packet. And then there's a checksum that goes along with it. So having that knowledge in hand, we can dig into the binary and figure out where does that function get called. And it was pretty easy to find. There's one call to it. And then we can also figure out how the parameters are passed. In this case, it was an x86 binary. So we can say, all right, the data is put in ECX at this instruction. The data length is in BL. So we know that now when we try to emulate this code, we just have to fix it up so that whatever mutated data AFL is going to give us, we we put a pointer to that data and then the length of that data into the appropriate registers before starting emulation. And then uh, as far as finding the start and end, end points, we're going to start at the starting breakpoint there at the top. And then we're, we're only going to run until that CDC receive packet function returns. And then at the end of that, our fuzzing run is, is complete, and we're ready to move on to the next test. Um, so now, at this point, we have everything we, we need to start fuzzing, and I'll turn it over to Parker to see what you do now. All right, so now we've done the analysis of what it is that we want to fuzz. The typical gap here is how do you actually get something like this into an emulation environment? So as a part of the AFL unicorn uh, suite of tools that we've created, we've also created some helper scripts that if you can remember what Nathan said, as long as you can get to some sort of debug capability on your target device or process, um, we can then dump that in a homogenous way to be able to load into Unicorn. So in this example, we're showing an IDA script that can be uh, dumped out. We can uh, LLDB or GDB as well. We've created helper scripts that once you run that at that breakpoint, you run with some good input to that breakpoint, you stop there, you run these scripts, the result of that is that it creates a directory for you with a binary enumeration of your entire memory space, an index JSON file that lays all that out, including memory uh, permissions and that kind of stuff, and then the CPU state, what kind of architecture you're running, what kind of registers, uh, values, et cetera. So now we're primed and ready to get that into uh, Unicorn. We've also provided Unicorn loader scripts. These Unicorn loader scripts provide a lot of helper utilities for dealing with Unicorn itself. Um, all it takes to load in that dumped format. So remember, this typically was a, a longer process of how do you emulate all these bits and stuff. Now we've just simply taken a memory snapshot of that device, uh, saved it into a context directory. In Python, we just instantiate one of the objects that we've created, which is an AFL unicorn engine. That's a class that wraps the unicorn engine itself but we can pass the context directory and it knows how to load in that context directory, map in all those pages with the right permissions, uh, CPU register states, et cetera, and to switch it into the right architecture modes. So now we've got a unicorn engine back preloaded with all of our state. So now we're at an emulated state of our device or target process within unicorn. Once we run the process, um, what uh, where the power of AFL and Unicorn together comes in is that once Unicorn starts running these instructions, AFL knows how to break into uh, Unicorn, save that state of memory, and then fork from that process. So instead of reloading the state every single run, we're sitting at a point where we already have it already primed, ready to go. We just want to execute, the, that, uh, execute that code. So we just let AFL just spin and fork off on that memory after it's already been loaded. We've uh, provided a force crash method on the engine. And what that does is uh, when Unicorn detects some sort of error condition, it's going to notify you in the Python, we can rethrow this with this force crash. That will allow AFL now to trap that error and do its standard bookkeeping. You know, it's going to capture all the artifacts, the inputs, categorize that code coverage, et cetera, for you. So AFL can now do its magic over Unicorn's emulated process. Um, different, uh, so you could get crashes that are legitimate, but you can also get a lot of uh, crashes during your emulation that are just emulation specific. Anytime you reach out to hardware, you're going to have a problem. Say you want a, a random number generator, you're going to call RAND. Uh, typically, that will call out to some sort of hardware uh, clock or timer or some other piece of peripheral to generate that random. So all we have to do in Unicorn 
is just hook those instructions, mock up our own data so we can create our own random number and feed it back and then continue on. We've also created in this uh, package of helpers uh, some uh, heap, uh, simple heap uh, implementation. So if you're OS specific, say you're a user process and it's going to reach back into the kernel with a syscall, we can also intercept those calls, implement our own heap within the unicorn memory space. So once we have our function, once we're uh, emulating it, before we can actually get good code coverage, we need to think about how we're going to get that input. And basically what we suggest is now you just follow AFL's best practices. AFL works really well. We can maximize the uh, target code coverage. We minimize the size of inputs. Uh, we generate enough good inputs and then use AFL's own T-min and AFL C-min to memorize those or to minimize those and to maximize that code coverage uh, just like AFL would with any other process. The AFL command now looks very similar to what we did before in the cat process, but this time we have added a few, uh, a few modifications. We have the dash U is our unicorn mode, um, and then also we have the M none flag, which we uh, suggest that you use. It turns off the memory constraints that AFL usually has. Uh, the path to the inputs that you've just generated, the outputs, but now instead of the cat process, we're going to, or this hardware device, we're going to pass in this harness that we've now just created that uses the unicorn engine with that context directory and, and AFL will now fly over that unicorn instance. As you can see here in that FSK um, uh, problem that we did, in under a minute uh, we were able to find a, a crash. If we let this run we actually find that there's a few crashes that come in there, but the one crash that it found was actually the one that uh, we were interested in from the Grand Cyber Challenge. Um, when you get a crash, it's important to triage those, run those back through your script, analyze, see if that was an emulation error, if that's a really uh, a heap overflow or whatever. So standard reversing process, standard fuzzing process now takes over. The important point here, though, is, is you've done this all in software, you've done it all in emulation, it's quick and it's fast, and now when you take this and go back to the real device, because you should always go back to the real device in process, not the emulated one, now you can use a targeted focused input of a known crash in emulation to go back to that device, create that input, saving you lots and lots of time and effort. So in summary for this one example, remember we have this FSK memory ser uh, messaging service. It's created by the Grand Cyber Challenge that said, due to its very nature, fuzzing will be ineffective. We've gone to where we need to in the breakpoint, we've emulated, and we believe that we've solved that problem. All right, so, um, so obviously AFL Unicorn works in, in the cases that we've tested it on, um, but what's next? What, what do we want to expand it to? Uh, the first one would be adding additional debugger support. Um, as we've talked about, we currently support Ida Pro's debugger, uh, the built-in one, um, GDB if you have GEF installed, and LDB. Um, but remember back that the only real requirement is that you can dump memory and dump the CPU state. So um, adding in more modules into AFL Unicorn for any other debuggers that we, that we were interested in, uh, it would be a great task and, and expand the usability of it. Um, beyond that, we'd really like to expand the, the helper utilities, um, namely improving the architecture support. Right now, we, we support um, x86, x64, and ARM for basically everything we've needed to use it for, um, but there's no reason that we couldn't expand those out to PowerPC and MIPS and Spark and all the other uh, architectures that Unicorn supports. Um, beyond that, there's um, OS-specific stubs that we, that we could implement, like Parker was saying. Um, when you run AFL Unicorn on a process that runs in an OS, there's lots of issues when it reaches back to the kernel. Uh, uh, it, it would be great to add a bunch of features uh, that would easily bypass those, um, depending on the OS that you're actually testing on. Um, additionally, uh, all of our helper utilities right now are very Python-centric, um, but Unicorn itself supports scripts and plugins written in Python and Go and C and a bunch of other languages. Um, there would be some performance benefit in porting all this to C and then writing your test harnesses in C. Um, we've seen some pretty dramatic speed ups with, with minimal tests in C. Um, <clears throat> so uh, to give credit where credit's due, um, this is obviously just a combination of other open source tools with a, with a little bit of, of glue between them, um, namely AFL itself. 
um, the Unicorn Engine. Uh, a lot of inspiration was taken from UMU, which is an awesome IDA plugin uh, for dumping state that you can then load in, into Unicorn. Um, then you, the user corn and Triforce AFL projects are, are similar to what we're doing, just with a different, different spin on them. Um, so to sum up, uh, AFL Unicorn lets you apply AFL's power and speed to absolutely anything that Unicorn Engine can emulate, no matter how big or small, as long as you can e emulate it from start to finish with your scripting. Um, the, uh, our contact information is up there, and then uh, the source code itself is available all on, all on GitHub. Um, and then two more uh, tutorials that go into a whole lot more depth than what we just went into um, are at those, those links. Uh, so with that, uh, any questions? Yes. How complex uh, a device can you have like, uh, export uh, things like uh, things with like built in uh, FPGAs, maybe around like some of the imports or outputs? Yeah, um, so the question was how complex of a device can we, can, do we support? Um, and the answer to that's really uh, dependent on how much time you're willing to put into emulating it, um, and and also how narrow of a scope you want. Um, so if you if you can narrow in through reverse engineering on exactly what you think is is the relevant parts of the code you want to fuzz, um, then it's just how, how you would then just need to take the time to write a unicorn script that lets you get from point A to point B, um, and the the difficulty of that is completely up to the complexity of the code. Um, so. So it's a really bad answer to your question, but it's, it's basically um, you want to narrow scope as much as possible um, so you can you know, uh, start small and then build your way out. Um, so does that <laughs> get there at all? All right, yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Uh, yeah, so the, the question was what necessitated the, um, the custom heap implementation. Um, the, the answer to that is we, we were applying AFL Unicorn to a Windows process. Um, and in that Windows process, um, the function that we were calling uh, very often, like, called, called malloc a whole lot. Um, so at some point, malloc reaches, like, runs out of space and reaches back down to the kernel. Um, and as soon as it hits the kernel, uh, the state that we had dumped doesn't have the kernel in it. So it, the emulation crashes. Um, so that was really the, the necessity for the uh, custom heap implementation. Um, in addition to that, though, when we implemented the custom heap, uh, we added uh, page guarding support. So if you're, if you're familiar with that, it basically lets you catch heap overflows and underflows much quicker at the exact point where the overflow occurs instead of requiring you to run to a free or, or something else. Uh, uh, any? Yes. Um, th there's not that I'm aware of. Um, that would be a, a great resource. Uh, uh, the question was, is there an, a known um, database of, of emulation issues and, and mitigations for those? Um, yeah, so the, the answer is, as far as I'm aware, no. Um, that would be a great thing to add to, to AFL Unicorn um, or Unicorn Engine itself. Um, and then uh, any time those mitigations are created, it would, it would be great to add those into our helper utilities and uh, make it easier to, to hook the, the part that's broken and then work, it, work your way around it. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. Effect, effective fuzzing. <laughs> yeah. so. Effective fuzzing, we found, almost always comes down to narrowing your scope, just like Nathan said. So if there is a piece that isn't compatible, is there a way to mock that? And typically, we sidestep, even in this uh, grand challenge function, if you, when you read through that, uh, there is a certain kind of like CRC parsing that it validates the code. You can just bypass that and just stub that out because that's not really the important part to fuzz. So usually being creative in how you fuzz and emulate this alleviates a lot of those problems. Cool. I think we're done. Thanks, guys. Thanks,